let's stay in the Big Ten for a minute before we talk about the SEC. I think you and I are probably going to disagree on this this particular case, which is fine. We haven't had a lot of disagreement so far in our discussion, uh, and we usually disagree on everything or most things or some things. Um, Shea Patterson going to Michigan is being talked a lot about, and I think part of it is because it seemed like last year – Michigan, honestly, for all they lost on both sides of the ball, especially on defense, had no business being good at all last year, in my opinion. I thought they did an amazing job, amazing job on the defensive side of the ball, and they just lacked any kind of production at quarterback to be in any way a threat to win the Big Ten. So a lot of other people saw that and and feel like with Shea Patterson coming in, this gunslinger from Ole Miss, he is the piece of the puzzle that they're missing. And what we're going to discuss here is whether or not he is that piece of the puzzle or if it's being somewhat or a lot overhyped. Now for people who don't know, and we're probably going to lose a lot of SEC fans here, but maybe pick up some Michigan fans. You weren't that high on Shea Patterson last year. Um, I think I was higher than him, and that's where I, where I can see our disagreement coming in. So before we get into specifically why we agree or disagree, talk a little bit from a high level if you think, I'll give you a couple of ways to approach this. One, is Shea Patterson that missing piece? So if you put him on that team last year, do they do really, really well? Two, is he an improvement and it won't matter Three, are his downsides such that he's not really much of an improvement at all because he has that risk factor of turning the ball over? So there's a lot to unpack there, but my take on Shea Patterson is that he's a really talented guy, but he's extremely inconsistent. And I think he can do a lot in certain games to be sort of a spark plug for the offense. But I don't think he has the consistency to be the guy that turns around a team because as much as he may win you a game, um, Shea Patterson absolutely can and will lose you a game. And in fact, more often than not, um, he kind of approached that. And, you know, as you said, we, I wasn't, and I know really neither one of us was that high on Shea Patterson, Um, coming out of the 2016 season, the year prior, you know, everybody looked at his recruiting ranking and he played in three games uh, in 2016 and he had a ton of yards, right? And he threw for almost a thousand yards, but he threw 40 to 50 passes in those three games. Two of the three were losses. One against Vanderbilt, one, one, they got, they beat Texas A&M 29 to 28. They lost to Vanderbilt 17 to 38 and they lost to Mississippi state 20 to 55 in those three games in, in 2016. Um, he threw six touchdowns to three interceptions in those games. Neither one of those three teams was particularly good. Uh, and uh, in no, none of the three games did he hit 60% passing. In fact, against Vanderbilt, he was only a 48% passer. So, you know, in 2017, for some reason, he had a tremendous amount of hype at Ole Miss. Neither one of us got that. Um, came in, we were really, really critical uh, of what he was going to be able to do. And, you know, he, he had a four and three record or excuse me, a three and four record as a starter at Ole Miss in 2017. Um, he beat South Alabama, Tennessee, Martin and Vanderbilt, which not exactly heavy hitters, uh, got, yeah, but who did he lose to? I mean, come on. Well, I was about to say, you know, it's, it's easy to say, well, when you play Alabama, Auburn, and LSU, you're going to lose a lot. Now they got destroyed in those games, right? They, aver- they lost by about an average of 30 points. He also lost by double digits, the cow. So let's not ignore that one either. And against Cal, he threw for eight yards an attempt, which may be great, but he threw for two touchdowns and three interceptions and was sub 60%. So against a team that was not particularly good, he wasn't a great quarterback. Um, And we kind of saw that for the most part, he swung up and down with a competition. My issue with Shea Patterson is he, he, he doesn't set his feet in the pocket. He doesn't stay where he needs to do. He doesn't go through his progressions. He constantly, he, basically, he's a guy trying to emulate Johnny Manziel that needs to realize he's not quite Johnny Manziel, which isn't an insult. Um, it, it's the fact that most people can't, on the run, flick their ball and throw it 30 yards downfield accurately. 
Um, he can't do it, even though he tries to. When he try, if he sits in the pocket and makes throws with, with using proper technique, he's an extremely talented quarterback. But in reality, when he gets in games and he gets pressured, he, he doesn't execute that way. Um, and that's why, personally, I going into the season, I didn't take it for granted that Shea Patterson was going to beat out Brandon Peters. And I think a lot of maybe a lot of Michigan fans are assuming that's going to happen, and they're just kind of waiting on it to turn around. I, I don't know that it will. And in my understanding right now is that it's still a very close quarterback battle. And that people are saying that, you know, don't count out Brandon Peters. People are shocked by it. But, you know, Shea Patterson was not a very accurate and consistent player. And moreover, you know, I mentioned the fact that Patterson was three and four. But, you know, the flip side of that is, you know, he got replaced uh, by uh, Tiamu. Tiamu went three and two. Now, the you know, the teams were a lot worse. So I, I think you throw a lot of that out. But uh, Tamu at Ole Miss was by and large a more successful quarterback than uh, was Shea Patterson. And I, you know, be very frank, I mean, Ole Miss had an exceptional receiving core, one of the very best in the country. Um, and, and honestly, you know, maybe Michigan fans may not like to hear this, but they were more talented than Michigan was last year, more talented than most teams because they have they had a roster completely full of five star, four star prospects. And Peoples Jones may be a great receiver, but when you got guys like, you know, Brown, who was the number one receiver in the country coming out of high school to throw to, it's a pretty big security blanket. And and even with all that, Shea Patterson wasn't able to execute at a high level. I would pause there for Michigan fans and say Ole Miss was more talented offensively, and they have they had multiple NFL wide receivers that, that Patterson was throwing to. But they had a garbage defense. I mean, Alabama beat them sixty-six to three. They're not beating Michigan sixty-six to three last year, and, and Alabama beat them sixty-six to three without even really trying. Um, I, I don't think that. So Vanderbilt put up thirty-five on them. I don't think Vanderbilt would put up ten on Michigan last year. So yes, uh, offensively, I, I do think they were more talented than Michigan uh, at almost every position, and it's not a slight because they put up a ton of points last year. But you know they beat Kentucky thirty-seven, thirty-four, lost to Arkansas when they gave up thirty-eight, so thirty-eight, thirty-seven. Um, so I think that's what people see is like, yeah, Ole Miss lost a lot of games last year, but they scored a lot of points. It'll be interesting to me, and I think I think maybe we can find some common ground here, some things that we can agree on. First of all, last year, Michigan quarterbacks were terrible. Agree or disagree? Agree. Yeah, and, and the thing is, the particular type of terrible that they were is why I think there's hope for Michigan fans in that they had some of what – so imagine if Jalen Hurts – played for Michigan but could not run the ball. That's what they had at quarterback. So it's frustrating when there's there's nothing you can even hope for. And there's nothing that you can even – that you really even have defenses scheming against because they know that there's so much that offensively Michigan cannot do. So – I would say that if we're not if we're not looking at the current quarterback battle, but we're looking at what Michigan had last year offensively versus what Michigan would have this year with Shade Patterson, yes, they're going to have some inconsistencies, and yes, I think they're going to have a lot of turnovers. Although, if we you know Wilton Spate threw two pick sixes against Florida and, and single handedly kept Florida in the game, um, I think that hope. And that opening up the playbook because he does have an arm that can deliver and because he does have some mobility, I think that hope of being able to do some of those things while still having a good defense is what is 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 why people are giving him a little bit of credit. Um, maybe maybe undo, maybe not. Yeah, and and I can understand and agree with that. I mean, when you you look back at Michigan season last year, right? They they had several games where. Yeah, they couldn't accomplish anything throwing the football. And, and I, I mentioned Brandon Peters because I think Peters has some upside, even though it didn't always show and, and really, you know, really struggled in that bowl game. But the, you know, when you look at the earlier part of the season, like the Michigan State game, you lose 10 to 14. Uh, your quarterback's 46% passing, throws for under six yards in an attempt, and throws three interceptions to no touchdowns. At some point, you're you're at the point where you know the quarterback's not accomplishing anything whatsoever. You take you take inconsistency if it means you have the the ability to threaten to throw the ball down the field. And at times, I don't think Michigan even had that. Uh, so I, I do agree, and I understand why 
Patterson probably will end up being the starter just because having having the mere threat to be able to do things on the field at least makes the defense play you honestly. Even if it results in some negative plays, it does open up the playbook. Um, but in the same coin, you know, the, my, you know, my point with this is I think a lot of people are their expectations for where Patterson is right now are probably grossly out of line with what they're going to see from a consistency perspective. And the guy is going to miss a lot of open play uh, receivers. He's going to make some dumb head, dumb decisions, throw interceptions. And in, when you're talking about a quarterback competition, I guess something that I should note that I'm factoring into this is I am kind of curious to see if Harbaugh will take a guy like that and put him in the position to play quarterback uh, because I don't think Harbaugh is going to accept a quarterback that's going to throw interceptions. And I do think, you know, six, seven, eight games down the road, you know, it may be able to develop Patterson into the kind of guy that he never really was at Ole Miss and calm him down and get him to play within the system. The problem with Patterson with his transfer situation is he's had very little time to learn the offense at, Ole, uh, at Michigan. And, you know, what he may be next year may be a totally different player than he is this year. But if if he comes into the ga- the game and he tries to just kind of run around and toss the football down the field, it's not something that's good for him. He does not need to run that style of offense, even though he wants to, um, just because he's not he's just not consistent enough when he does it. All right, so we're a numbers driven channel for you, Michigan fans who haven't happened across our channel before. So I'm going to throw a couple of numbers and scenarios at you and tell me if it changes your mind at all. Um, so we talked about the, the few games that he lost. So 40 to 24 LSU is when he got hurt. It's really kind of hard to put that one on him. Uh, and Alabama, I think you throw out, uh, you throw it out for anybody in terms of quarterback performances, unless you're Deshaun Watson, uh, you, you throw it out. He had a pretty good game against Auburn. I think he, his yards for attempt weren't great. Um, but I think there's something really interesting here and it's the Vanderbilt game. So they won 57 to 35, gave up a ton of points. It's ridiculous. Vanderbilt shouldn't have crossed the 50 on anybody last year. So 35 points is ridiculous, but he threw for 10 yards an attempt. And then you think about Alabama beat them like 59 to nothing or something like that. And you think, okay, Jalen Hurts started that game and Alabama drilled them. So Vanderbilt's defense was kind of trash last year. But Jalen Hurts threw for 4.6 yards an attempt in that game. They ran the ball really well, but through the air, they didn't have any success until the gunslinger came in and Tua just shredded them. He had that ridiculous throw that everybody saw that's been on every highlight reel in the world, but he also just methodically shredded their secondary where Jalen Hurts wasn't able to, where an O'Corn wouldn't have been able to, where a Wilton Spate wouldn't have been able to. Um, So I do think it's interesting, that game in particular, that similar in, in terms of defensive setup, and we've seen teams struggle against Vanderbilt, Kansas State, same way, he had something, some kind of capability that Jalen Hurts didn't have, that Kansas State didn't have and came in and put up 10 yards in attempt against that Vanderbilt defense. Is that, is that changing your mind at all? Not a ton. <laughs> I'll give you two reasons why. Um, the first you mentioned Auburn. There's a big caveat to me with that performance against Auburn, which was solid. And that's that Shea Patterson played well into the second half against Auburn. If you remember that game, they were down. It was like, I forget what the box score was, but something like 44 to 10. And they kept him in, and, and most of their yardage came against Auburn's second and third stringers. So Ole Miss didn't do anything um, against the early in the, in the early going against Auburn. I mean, Ole Miss, as we said, they were really, really talented offensively, but there was a point there really after the Alabama game where they just seemed to have completely given up. And again, like you said, the defense was atrocious, which put a tremendous amount of pressure on the offense to score constantly. Um, but the Vanderbilt game in particular, um, you know, they gave the, – yeah, they had 10 yards per attempt against – Vanderbilt and Alabama wasn't able to do that. But after that Alabama game, when, when Vanny got taken to the woodshed 59 and nothing, they did lose 38, 24 to Florida and Felipe Franks in Florida, which Michigan got to see last year. Franks put up 9.6 yards per attempt on Vanderbilt. And then from very young from put up nine yards per attempt. Um, so it's, it's not like teams weren't having success with, against Vanderbilt in the middle of the year. They kind of rebounded late, but uh, you know, Kentucky put up 11 and a half yards per attempt on them. So I, I don't know how much you can take from that. And and this is really the problem with 
Patterson overall, I will say for both of us, it's the reason we're having this discussion. And maybe it's the word of caution and maybe either one of us could be completely wrong. Patterson has not played a season yet of college football. He has not played one full season of college football. He's played three games in 2016. He played half a season last year for a team that didn't make a bowl. We don't really know exactly what he's like because we've seen him play some really bad teams and sh- and do exceptionally well. We've played seen him play some top 10 teams and get kind of pummeled. I it's hard to take a whole heck of a lot from that, uh, especially given that we don't have you know, we don't have an honest body of work for the guy playing against you know, average defenses. So uh, it will be interesting. I, I think I could be completely wrong on this. I'll, I'll I'll totally go along with that. But I also just haven't seen anything statistically that backs up uh, the, the amount of production you would expect from a guy with his recruiting ranking. I got one more, and then I'll stop trying to convince you. Um, and this isn't more, this isn't so much of a argument for Shea Patterson, but more of a solicitation for you to offer some, some insight of what you think in terms of whether or not this could be the case at Michigan. So we've seen quarterbacks, good quarterbacks at teams with absolute trash defenses going into the game, knowing they've got to score 35 points to have a prayer in the game. And it mentally impacts the quarterback in a lot of ways. And it leads to a lot of inconsistencies and a lot of turnovers. How much are you willing to attribute Shea Patterson maybe not being great because he had that pressure on his shoulders knowing how bad his defense was? And how much of it do you think is just Shea Patterson? And do you think he could potentially change his mindset given that he's going to be playing on a team with a good defense? Now that I I can, I can get behind that argument. And th- this goes to what I was saying earlier. Shea Patterson, if he feels like he needs to run around and make plays and, you know, be a Wild West Cowboy quarterback, he struggles because he he just doesn't throw the ball well when he isn't using proper technique. And he has a lot of athleticism, and it's his temptation. If you actually make that kid play within the system, if you make him go through his progressions properly and set his feet and make proper throws – he could be a really good quarterback. And a lot of what's probably going to happen at Michigan is Jim Harbaugh basically is going to have to break the Bronco and he's going to have to turn him into a real pocket passer that he should be with a little bit of escapability and not the guy that we saw at times at Ole Miss where um, he just kind of runs around like a chicken with his head cut off again, trying to do a Johnny Manziel impersonation um, and and doing it somewhat poorly. Um, So, I do think if you limit him, if you make him a 20 th- a throw passer or 20 throw a game passer, if you let him be a guy that operates within the system and you really push him to minimize his mistakes, take the throws when they're there, not try to make something happen when it's not, you could end up with a very very different quarterback. I totally buy that. Um the question really I think is how long it takes to get there and as I said, it's really not ideal for it to happen immediately because of the transfer situation that he's in, which is frankly unique. And we don't know quite how that plays out in and of itself. Uh, one real quick look at Michigan's schedule. I think this is another fair question. Is it fair to say potentially that Michigan could be a better team with Shea Patterson and Shea Patterson be a good solution for them, and they have a worse season. And I say this because they start out with Notre Dame, which is a a far better team than last year's Florida, even defensively, uh, where Florida had a little bit of of talent. I think Notre Dame is a better defensive team. Um, But they also get Wisconsin, Michigan State, Penn State, and Ohio State in the regular season, which is just like – is in, we talk about the Big Ten having this sort of bag of wins. If you if you win the the Rutgers Maryland lottery, you usually don't have one of those teams on your schedule in terms of the big heavies. They've got all four and Notre Dame. And by the way, there's this sneaky game against Indiana right before Ohio State, and people don't realize Indiana. Not great last year, but they had a top 20 pass defense, which I think is a weird stat because they always get just completely run out of the building. But is it fair to say, looking at that schedule, they've also got Northwestern and Nebraska, um, that they could potentially not have a great record but be a better team? 
I think it's totally possible. I mean, Michigan last year, like you said, really kind of pulled a rabbit out of their hat, I think, with the success they had. They had total turnover. They were extremely aggressive defensively. We talked about this a lot, that they had kind of a interesting <laughs> defensive statistics because they either – they either stopped you cold at the line of scrimmage or they gave up a touchdown and there was nothing in between. And they more or less did that so that they could produce wins from a team that really, when you, I won't say they weren't talented, that's not the right word, but they weren't a great football team yet because they were so, so inexperienced. Um, I think they're going to be better this year. They almost have to be. And we talked about the fact that whether or not Patterson starts, really it's a side discussion because you're either end up with a quarterback you had last year who's going to be more experienced and better, where you're going to end up with a new quarterback that's better than the old guy. Anytime you have a quarterback competition where a new guy is pushing the old guy, you're going to be better off because the, the worst case scenario is you end up with a guy you had with an extra year. Um, but like you said, I mean, Notre Dame in an opener is going to be tough. Notre Dame was a very good team last year. Um, and, you know, when you move through that schedule, uh, there, there's not a lot of easy games, and especially that – that run from October 13th with, against Wisconsin through November 24th at Ohio State, it, it's just brutal. And if the games are more spaced out, it might be better. But, uh, you know, like you said, other than that one Rutgers game in there, you got five or six games against, uh, you know, pretty darn good teams. Four of the six may all be ranked. Uh, that's that, that's a pretty impressive schedule. And it it's just tough to run gauntlets like that and not deal with injury issues and other problems that end up giving you a loss or two um, that you might not otherwise have. 